in an engineered world. And one of the ways that we engineer our physical environment is through a process that we call the engineering design and development process. I'll call it the engineering design process for short. It's a process that allows us to go from an idea in our heads all the way to a real product, a product that's a physical reality. And that product can be a building that you can see from miles away or a tiny integrated circuit. And during that process, we make decisions that have a significant impact on the outcome. One of those impacts may be cost, quality, or functionality, but also who will have access to that product and whose needs that product will meet. So I come to this topic from at least three different perspectives. As a an, as an working engineer in industry, I have applied this process many, many times. As an applied anthropologist, I have studied this process from a social science perspective. And as an instructor, I teach this process to my students. So today's talk brings my different worlds together, and I hope to share with you perhaps a different way of thinking about engineering and perhaps a different way of doing engineering. So when you think about engineering development, you see that it's guided by a need. And those who define that need generally are people that we consider customers. In other words, who have buying power. So it's fair to say that we meet the needs of those who have money. It's very rare to, say, to see individuals from communities that are struggling financially be the ones who would define what their needs are so that engineers would work on it, because they're not considered viable customers. So it's fair to say that we neither see them nor hear them in the world of engineering. So let me give you a quick example. For instance, the latest smartphone from Apple, the XS model, it's about $1,000. So $1,000 means different things to different people. For instance, for me, it could mean traveling all the way across the world to see my 83-year-old mother in Sydney, Australia. But if you don't have that choice or you don't have that money, the world looks different. A couple of years ago, some engineers studied how people who are experiencing homelessness use technology. They saw that people who are homeless purchase smartphones sometimes at the expense of purchasing food because they use those as a lifeline. They use smartphones to find jobs, to find housing, and many other things that help them survive. So when you look at this, you think, whose needs are being met? The needs of those who use a smartphone as a lifeline, and they have no money, and they have to buy it at the expense of perhaps purchasing food, or the needs of those who have maybe $1,000 in their pocket. So the argument is that people who invest in technologies, which is a risky business, need to have a high return on investment. I don't have a problem with that model. I agree with that model. But the notion, the model that says we should create value only for those who have money is very exclusive. And some would argue it's not just bad for society, but it's also bad for engineering. So I would like to propose a model that is much more inclusive and is guided by the needs of those who are traditionally excluded from engineering. So let me quickly address the funding model. We can't do anything without money. But the funding for these kinds of developments would come from the normal sources, such as philanthropists, socially minded entrepreneurs, and socially minded um, corporations who donate some of their funding towards these kinds of developments, or government funds, or many other sources. We just have to be sure that those funds are applied towards the right model. So what does that model look like? I propose that we take the engineering design process and we embed it in a participatory empowerment model. 
Participatory empowerment models are things that anthropologists use to empower people in certain communities to identify a need, to find a solution for that need, and then to implement that need with a goal of creating a positive change that would be sustainable. Now, if we take that process and apply it to the engineering design process, what we will see is that individuals in communities who are traditionally excluded participate in the engineering design process from the first step to the last. That means they will define their goals, their, their needs, they will look at the various trade-offs that is the hallmark of engineering and decide which trade-offs fit their needs and decide which solutions among many would fit their needs all the way to deciding where that product will be developed and who will develop it. So in a summary, they would be completely involved in making those important decisions that shape the product in exactly the way they would want and would be accessible and affordable. And they would, of course, do this in partnership with engineers. So there is more to this than meets the eye. When you participate in this process, it's a real empowering process. You go from an idea to a reality, a physical reality that meets a need. Individuals who participate in this process will see their own potential for creating a change within their own community. That's what I call capacity building. And that experience would last much longer than their participation in one project. But of course, you cannot have engineering development without an ecosystem. Now that ecosystem is going to bring further benefits. One of them is of course access to experts. Besides community members and engineers, there would be social scientists, business people, lawyers, policy makers, environmentalists, many different experts that would be working within this, this ecosystem to support engineering product development. Access to these experts by communities who rarely have access to such experts would be an added benefit. Now, needless to say that in this ecosystem, you will have support industries, support industries that hire skilled workers. Now, if done right, this could lead to creation of jobs, well-paying jobs for people. So that might have a positive impact on the communities as well. And a product that's built for humans by humans will have markets elsewhere. If this product is sold outside of these communities, the funds that come back in could be used to invest in further development, making this an economically sustainable model, possibly. So, and so on and so forth. So you can see the benefits to the community. But I want to mention that this is in stark difference to a model where well-meaning individuals with funds decide for such communities what their needs would be and what the solution would be. This is not that model. I also want to mention that besides communities benefiting from such a model, engineering would benefit. When engineers work as partners with people in this model, that one-on-one -on -one understanding of how what we do shapes a product that meets a need, we learn how to serve people the way our profession is intended to serve people. I think that's a big plus for engineering. In addition, the kinds of problems that we'll be involved in would be much more diverse than what we are involved in today. That might give rise to further research in the field of engineering. That's another plus for engineering. But more importantly, when you think of communities that are impoverished, their children grow up in those communities not knowing what engineering is or what engineers do. They have no way of connecting their world to the world of engineering. 
But in this model, they will witness firsthand the impact of using engineering as a tool to benefit their own community. They might see themselves as the future engineers. They might consider engineering as a viable career choice. That would be the most meaningful way of bringing diversity to engineering, which is something that is badly missing in engineering. That would be another plus for engineering. So in summary, I wanted to share with you a different way of doing engineering and a different way of thinking about engineering. I think this participatory empowerment model of engineering product development process has the potential of bringing the world of engineering to communities that are traditionally excluded from engineering. And it has the potential of creating economic, positive economic impact. Now, as far as engineering profession itself is concerned, engineering is known for the good that it does as well as the not so good that it does. But to tip the scale towards the good, our profession needs to be guided by the needs of all people and not just money. I'm going to leave you to for, with uh, something to think about on your way home. Imagine what would happen if smartphones were developed by people who are experiencing homelessness. What would they look like? What would they cost? What would be the functions that would be in those phone phones? Who would support the phones in terms of service? How much would that cost? Who else in society would be able to use those phones? And what would engineers learn from that experience that would contribute to a more innovative way of thinking about the future generation of smartphones? I wonder. Thank you.